Well, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to talk to you about our work in trying to understand how we can interpret human behavior using speech. And I used to start these presentations with a really long, drawn-out indication of how important speech is. But instead of trying to motivate how important it is to not just consider what we're saying, but how we're saying it, I'm just going to play this example. Delayed bag. Yes. Peoria. Peoria. No. Peoria. P-I-A. No, can I talk to a person? So as it turns out, when we're designing automated interactions, that's sort of not our goal. What we're trying to do is come up with seamless interactions, things that will meld into people's lives, but occasionally things go wrong. Things go wrong because our agents misunderstand us, and then we have what our group loves to focus on, which is emotion. And you can tell that she was emotional. You can tell because of, I'm not actually sure how the pointer part works, not like that. You can tell because of salient words, things like no, things like computer. You can tell she was mad because she started yelling. Her pitch started changing. But really what's important is, it's not just what she's saying, it's how she's saying it. Because fundamentally, fundamentally, this stuff matters. As engineers, what we're trying to do is figure out how to see inside someone's brain. We know there are complicated machinations that are leading to the behaviors that we observe, but the challenge is that, again, as engineers, that's how we normally see it. We see behavior arrive on the output, and then we have to try to do some kind of inverse mapping to figure out what is going on in this black box of humanity. And it matters because occasionally we have data that look like this. We have some little guy who's very, very angry, and we're not sure why. But what we can do is try to interpret his behavior. We see that he's yelling, and we're going to try to go backwards. But even before we can get to that step, we need to do something more first. And what we need to do is really figure out how he's doing. And as engineers, we've got this. We've got a pipeline. We can say, we're going to look at that behavior, we're going to try to measure it, and we're going to try to categorize it. And we set up an engineering pipeline. And the engineering pipeline looks like this. We have some kind of conversational data. Maybe we recorded it ourselves. Maybe we found it in some kind of publicly available data set. And we extract the information that we care about. In our group, we care deeply about speech. So we have some kind of a signal. From there, we extract some type of short-term measurements. And the goal of these things, which we call features, the goal of these are to try to figure out how we can associate these small variations with something else that we might care about. Maybe we care about the level of anger, for example. And then what it gives us is this beautiful temporal description of how this person's behavior is varying in time. And that's great, because there's so much we can do if we can just understand how somebody's doing. And then if we're really lucky, we have the opportunity to de deploy this back into the wild and say, OK, now I have a picture for how behavioral variations are going to map onto you. And now I can understand your behaviors in the wild. That's great. Problem done. We're solved, right? <laughs> but are we really? Is it enough to do this? Is it enough to just look at snapshots of behavior and decide that we understand? Are we done? No, we're not. And we're not because of things like this. So this is an example from a face, not a voice. But I think it clarifies the point in a beautiful way. So if we look at his face, we can look at his face and think, oh my goodness, things are not going well. You are in pain, or you're really angry, or something horrifying has just happened to you. But I've seen that before. My guy, my guy has that same face. And so I can say, that is brilliant. I understand he's angry. I am done. I can map on confident, confident, confident prediction. But the problem is, I only have a snapshot of this other person's behavior, and it's not enough to understand the context. And the context is that he just scored a goal. That is pride, possibly a relatively aggressive form of pride, but that's pride. And that's accomplishment. And that's the challenge of this field, because fundamentally what we're trying to do is figure out how to computationally model subjective experiences. And in subjective experiences, Context matters, because what's missing here is context. We know that he's yelling, but we don't know why. What would happen if we actually had the full picture? What if we understood that the reason why he's yelling is that somebody's yelling at him? How would that change how we're thinking about things? Well, people have thought of this. 
There are plenty of laboratory experiments. You bring people into a lab, you get them as angry as you can, and all of a sudden you have the context and you also have the emotion. But the problem is that whenever we bring someone into a lab, we've sort of changed their behavior. They very much know that they're being observed and they're not in their natural environment anymore. Okay, there's another alternative. We can just follow somebody as they go about their daily life. We have a team of researchers who are taking video or taking audio, and now we are embedded in natural life. But the problem is, knowing you're observed again changes your behavior. And so the question that we've been asking recently is how can we change this paradigm? How can we leverage powerful portable devices as a way of doing behavior sensing in the wild? Because context matters. And context matters for many reasons. So this is, the, this is a symposium about AI and society. AI and society can benefit a lot from understanding context. So in this first example, this is a woman who has had a stroke and she's trying to go through rehabilitation with a robot. Well, if the robot's not aware of the context and is just tracking her behavior, which I don't mean to indicate is particularly easy, but is something you could do, then the challenge is that he, it might miss out on things like frustration or depression. How is it going to know what types of exercises to suggest and how to track progress if it's not tracking those aspects of how? Or you can take a computer agent that's designed to teach people emotion. Well, if you don't know the context for behavior, you're going to learn emotion that's not quite going to map onto the real world. And you can also look at other types of societal uh, impact. For example, in autism, if you can understand the context that's resulting in kids with autism having certain types of behavior, then you have the potential to have real behavioral therapies develop. Or in the case of depression, if you can understand the types of environment that are leading people to feel depressed, again, you can have interventions. In bipolar disorder, perhaps you can have ways of averting episodes. In schizophrenia, perhaps you can have new ways of understanding when medication is not being effective anymore or when adherence is going down. In marital relationships, if you can understand the interaction dynamics that are leading to positive or negative outcomes, you can do something. And fundamentally, if we understand context, then we can build agents that are respecting this context, that are interacting in the ways that we expect them to, because context matters. And I'm going to talk specifically about some of our work in bipolar disorder. So just for those who aren't familiar, bipolar disorder is a common and chronic disease that's characterized by pathological swings into depression, which are lows, and mania, which are highs. Now, colloquially, we use the term bipolar disorder in a really unacceptable way to mean I've had a bad day one day and a good day the next. That is absolutely not what bipolar disorder is. The uh, transitions into mania or depression are associated with profound consequences with respect to your personal life, your social well-being, your financial well-being, and your vocational status. It is critical that we find ways to avoid these transitions. And in fact, if you look at an individual with bipolar disorder, uh, over a group of individuals. Um, an individ uh, t two years after suffering a manic episode, 40% of people are still not back to their pre-mania functioning level. It is critical that we find ways of avoiding these transitions. And that's what we've been trying to do. We're trying to come up with new speech biomarkers that will allow us to intuit that there's a problem on the horizon so that people can get access to care when they need it. So instead of swinging down into these depression lower lows and heightened highs of mania, we can have people stay on a more stable baseline. And since we're near Detroit, we use the analogy of the check engine light. If we can know that someone is, is having a, a risky period of time, we can make sure they get the care they need, hopefully averting these swings and keeping them on a more steady baseline. And so our goal is to help people stay healthy, reducing episode severity, decreasing the length of hospitalization, extending mental health coverage by figuring out how to effectively prioritize care, and improving patient scheduling. And so we're doing this through uh, collaboration with the Depression Center here on campus through the PRIORI project, which stands for Predicting Individual Outcomes for Rapid Intervention where we're collecting and analyzing large-scale data for people with bipolar disorder to develop mood recognition systems. Our original cohort had 51 patients with bipolar disorder and nine healthy controls who use our platform for six months to a year, although now we're up to about 77. And our platform was simple. It's a smartphone. Everyone has smartphones. And the only way you can tell that this device was on was that there's a tiny little black M in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, which indicated that our system was recording. The interface shown is only if people wanted to uh, make us stop recording, which, of course, is their purview. 
And what this app does is it records their side of every single call they make or receive while they're using our study phone. Because once we have this, we, we can start to understand how natural speech varies with health. And once you understand, understand that, you can do something. We, we do all of our processing offline at the moment, um, but we extract features, so for example, the frequency parameters of someone's voice, and then our goal is to detect mood symptoms. Because if we can really do this check engine light, uh, this check engine light identification, then we can cue interventions and help people get the care they need when they need it. Our data set size, although not quite the size of those at Google, is still quite large for academia. We have over 50,000 calls we've recorded and over 4,000 hours of natural conversational speech data that are also associated with mood symptom severity. But is that enough? Because we know that low-level speech varies on the order of milliseconds. Mood varies on the order of days to weeks. How do we do this mapping? Well, we can think about what we were talking about earlier. Context matters. So if we go back to our little bud, perhaps it's enough to know that his emotions are changing. Bipolar disorder is fundamentally a disorder of emotion dysregulation. If we can understand how the emotion patterns are varying over time, then perhaps this is going to provide us with the context that we need. So our question is, how does emotion naturally vary with mood? Well, we can collect data over the course of days, of weeks, of months, that will allow us to start to answer this question. We can then measure patterns in emotion and try to figure out how these patterns will allow us to understand mood state. And to echo what, what Jason was just saying, we use deep learning. It's not really that important to understand the diagram itself. But the fundamental thing to take away from this is that now we have the techniques to actually extract emotion accurately in the wild. It doesn't have to be in the laboratory for us to be able to do this. We can capture these patterns. How positive versus how negative are you? How calm or how excited? And how does that tell us more about well-being? Because as it turns out, it does. We can, we can look at clinical interactions, because we have a portion of our data that also are clinical interactions, and we can relate mood to emotion in this subset. And what we find is that valence, positive versus negative, and activation, calm versus excited, they're both statistically significantly higher when someone's in a manic episode compared to when someone's in a depressive episode. So what that's telling us is that emotion matters. What we also know is that it's not just that they're statistically significantly different in classes. What we also know is that the patterns in emotion expression co-vary with changes in mood. So what that's telling us is that we can use emotion as our context to understand how mood is expressed in speech. Because fundamentally, where that leads us is understanding how behavior in daily life maps onto emotion variation, which maps onto mood variation. Because overall, our goal is this, is to understand how we can use human-centered computing to understand behavior. So thanks. I'd be happy to take any questions.